I wrote a thesis. I made musics, collated them, and wrote about them. I am asked to type my name on the front of my thesis. No, not asked, expected to, by some hopeless valorization of authorship and the vain glory of attaining a degree that I alone have created. No, not expected, commanded, by whom? By the bureaucratic dictates of a university archive that must be organized by said names. They are primary in this archive, before title, before content, before impact. I am prescribed this format by a template on the university website, a form I had to submit alongside redoubles this. The examiners address me by this name when I walk into my viva, and it is indelibly marked on a physical certificate. Why am I to type my name? To whom am I appealing? Perhaps a past incarnation of myself, nominally, existentially, somatically. At a personal level, I feel detached from that name. Unsure if I ever responded to it as something synonymous or even possessed by myself. All was in service to a time before. I presented a portfolio. Of what? Pieces been and gone, necessarily segmented from the coiling of time by a deadline. To work within the shadow of a capitalist demand for progress which obliterates the past. To declare certain completion, such that they might be examined such that they might be subordinated to an accelerationist production line. In this representationalist structure, I set a signified practice against the transcendental signifier reflection. My portfolio is framed in reflection, thus exists in ecstasis from my own being. And insofar as being is in truth bound up in movement through the world, I inadvertently declare in this distance an immutability of self. In this institutional model of production, the writing me is mutilated into the precise translation of the logocentric practical me. As a requirement of the submission, under the header Declaration, I write, I declare that this thesis is a presentation of original work, and I am the sole author. And while I have not rewritten my name, there is an obvious intention to equivocate the two. I speak in I here too begrudging this device for the sake of clarity. But one understands this as standing in for the name on the cover of the thesis, or in the program for this conference. But as an awful quirk of English, the letter is so singular, so phallic, and it is capitalised even in the middle of the sentence, differentiating it or exempting it from the otherwise consistent grammatical structures in which I play. These structures seem more malleable by contrast, but at the expense of subordination to the capital I. Would that this malleability could be made without subjection. Yet we might acknowledge the I as not name, not a representation of the name, but its erasure, and in so doing, performing it as a phallus, a linearity reaching back into the past as unbroken as the stroke of my pen. My being stops here, bracketed by a bar line, my sensory limbs severed like Robert-François Damien, by a phallogocentric blade which can only separate binding ligaments. The bar line commands in retrospect by confining the preceding rhythm to meter, even if it is not sounded or glimpsed by the listener. As I type these words, I elect to make the I lowercase, so that I might remain conscious of the relationality of myself. Andrea Dworkin attempts the same, intending to fuck in the old sense book reviewers, maman. Fuck in the old sense this declaration, the residue of the academy. Were I to handwrite the calligram lowercase i, I would make two distinct gestures, drawing down a line, superficially similar to the capital letter. Then, through a sudden spatial temporal bolt of inspiration, I raise my pen and make a dot. In the two gestures I mark a difference which troubles the singular eye. Like difference, difference, it is only perceivable in writing. Perhaps this goes to the necessity of practice-based research and the oracular revelation of the indeterminacy of practice in and through its relation to research. The lowercase i is also a complete sign, because the sign is this differentiating chain. And if I have and desire to express my being, to write myself, it seems better to locate myself in the silent gap between line and dot, that I cannot speak, yet which is nevertheless sensible. 
The capitalized I is too much a celebration of life eternal, where to identify with it can only be positive. One can only locate oneself on the lie. Yet the lowercase I is the very coiling together of presence and absence that defines being. And it is certainly more true of the experience of practice where my body is significant, where it is inaudible and invisible in the performance. The lowercase i is the progression of crotchets, quavers and semi-quavers which litter my submitted scores. Though it is unmetered, the unfurling of music over time. Of course we hear the rhythm in perpetual reference to our memory. Yet also what feels like an inexorable springing forward of structure that was present even in the silence before the first note. Something integral of musicality, of practice-based research, becomes lost in the naming I. It is telling that my name appears on the cover and then vanishes into the capital I. At once I declare a stable past which looms large over the future. It is itself unchanging yet never voiced again. The capital I is understood to represent it perfectly, yet is distinct in form and prompts a change from third person to first person. The language and format of the research assumes at once a fixed past which we might authentically represent. A present which is at ecstasis from this past, which then goes on to deny either the co-constitutive nature of difference or this difference in its entirety. It is such a quiet gesture, a clerical convention that is once inconsequential, and perhaps I have already spent too long languishing in this analysis, yet can easily escape our consciousness. I suggest that we ignore its internal contradictions at our peril. This reductive naming is a metaphysic a part of a pattern of thought which precedes any attempt to grasp methodology, and left unchallenged risks not simply a poor intellectual understanding of our relation to the past, but where this representationalist relation is not axiomatic, but culturally and co coercively enforced, suborned to capitalist patterns of fragmenting our being in the world. Our practice-based research, whatever methodology, situates our practice in an historical relation. To write is already to be in the currents of writing, and we experience it the same as we perform. At the contact of bow to string or tongue to read, as we prepare to perform, we find ourselves already within the music. Music which uniquely among the arts one must inhabit and be inhabited by to perceive. A painting may be over there, an object on a wall, and indeed we must stand at a certain distance in order to perceive it. In this distance we might, if we so choose, imagine the difference between painter and painting, between the spot or line of colour and its effect in the whole, between where the painter stands close to the canvas with their brush to paint details and the framed work in a gallery. While Merleau-Ponty reminds us that this closeness is always the wrong side of painting, which mistakes a sum of signs for the infinite fecundity of signification, in music we cannot even entertain this wrong side. The vibrations in the air around us are always in contact with our skin, penetrating our ear canals. Sound moves in non-Euclidean ways, where its incident upon us is our impact upon it. And like a Klein bottle, exteriority and interiority are muddled. When I play my clarinet, I experience the exterior of the instrument in terms of my interior diaphragm, the intertwining point of contact at the mouthpiece the transience of air flowing in and out, the dialoguing of what I and others hear, expect to hear and remember hearing, the anticipation before the first note and the propensity for the next. How could we imagine ourselves close enough to observe the points and lines of sound when our perception of these points and lines is dependent on being within the effect of the whole? A reflective methodology which presumes to be outside of music it reflects upon is in crisis from its imagining. It names a name, calls itself I, and insists too much and too little on a separation between the two. To lose the musicality of musicology seems to me a betrayal. In this way I have already given too much credence to the structures of the reflected text at the expense of practice, and in that we are not practitioners then reflectors as a binary opposite, but the complete being practice-based researchers, we need only to examine the internal structure of our practice itself. Whether made explicit or not, the artwork exists in history. 
music has its own differential temporality, giving the impression that this movement that starts up is already at its end point. I have already alluded to rhythm which at once carries us with it through time, tripping forward onto the next note, only becoming defined when we perceive the past in this future which gives each note its relative length. Anticipated retrospection, retrograde movement in futuro. Likewise for pitch, a note in a mode, harmony or tone row which only has significance because it is both not the other pitches and yet contains them. Each one a universe which, like the musician, must inexorably give rise to music. Likewise again for whole structures, the silence before and after the first and last applause of the concert reversing onto each other, such that each gives rise to the other and the form of the piece is revealed at the fulcrum. It is the same pregnant period of desire that entreats us to make music, which is continuous with the hiatus after the publication of research. The period before it is the wellspring of research, the period after spurring us on to further musicking. We clearly do not translate our practice out of one structure into another for the purpose of analysis, nor do we move from one structure to the same one in a different time. We find that looking back to our practice is simply one more spiral of our practice itself. At the moment our desire for reflection bursts forth from inside ourselves, we find ourselves already within this reflection. At the moment of practice our reflection is already fully formed, and said practice flows forth from this reflection. The reflexive turn is nothing more than a conscious awareness of our being in the world. We might call these spirals styles, and perhaps that is all practice-based research is. An explication of the style of our practice in the context of other styles, through the socio-spatial historical context of other styles, which are always intersubjective, all differentiated through the style of our writing. It would be dishonest, however, to suggest that this style emerges positively. How might we understand the style of a composer, a performer, a writer, if not in how they differ from one another? If not, we would be forced to conclude that either style was some natural representation of the world, or that all art is undifferentiated we know neither to be true. For any claim of inspiration, homage or legacy, the very possibility for perceiving one style for another is located at those curious points where there is a direct contradiction between styles. If these differential chains exist within each sign, practice and research, then there is no reason to conclude anything other than this same chain exists when practice and research are twinned within a new sign. This points firstly to what the object of our analysis might be. Not the centre of our style, but its edges. Not where the world has retreated, but the points of contact our music in flesh has with the world. For example, I cannot reasonably justify why I have written a crotchet here instead of a quaver, pretending that I have detached my style from all others in some divine genesis. There is a certain narcissism in this pretending that our choices and preferences as artists are natural and autoboyetic. My style lies not in the crotchet, but at the juncture between the crotchet and quaver, and more importantly, that there was a possibility I could have made a different creative decision. To explain why I have chosen a crotchet does not produce any knowledge of musical practice as a field of inquiry. It only writes my name on the cover and claims the capital I as truth, when in fact it is a contingent metaphor. Negative style secondly suggests what the epistemological relationship between our practice and reflection should be. In our direct perception of our practices, we might only be certain of everything it is not. Once we pay attention to this point of turning, we turn with it. To select an object, a methodology, a format should be considered as much a matrix of desire and preference as choosing a crotchet over a quaver. Just as the artwork cannot be extracted from the world, so we cannot stand aside and examine our style objectively, since that style only exists in how we differ from it. Our epistemology must move with this ontological reality, so to write about my creative practice cannot describe what it is without changing its substance into something else. Every time I grasp at the choices I made, I elucidate all the choices I did not make. The crotchet not quaver system of signification is part of the limping towards understanding. I certainly will not speak against a desire to perceive the mountain which is cloaked in mist, and one can never fault or dissuade artistic desire or preference. 
but I acknowledge that, that this desire is itself dependent upon being in the mist and maintaining it. The fulcrum between practice and reflective research is thus always elusive. And this is not merely academic but political, nurturing a scepticism of the museum, the library, the concert hall as capitalist modes of production. The will to a certain knowledge or even of methodology makes a claim on reality that is contemptuous of the living reality of perception, which is itself the stylization of reality and forgets where the organs of our perception are the organs of culture. Reflection always organises our practice to some extent, because perception does the same, and if only for a fleeting moment we might see the world collapse into recognisable forms. Yet these forms always have hidden faces. I can only see three faces of a cube at one time, and though I do not doubt the existence or nature of the other faces, I understand that the structure of these hidden faces is in the visible ones, and vice versa. I do not claim full access to or possession of the sensible world. The museum all too often makes us forget this. It collects works to shield them from history, pretending that there are no hidden faces. Of course such a collection signifies what is not there in absentia, what the institution declares unworthy or degenerate. But in our museum culture, which claims to represent history divided from our present, we must actively pursue the absence for it to be visible. Dewey criticises this form of the museum as memorials of the rise of nationalism and imperialism, where the typical collector is the typical capitalist. If our research shields us our practice from history by preserving it as logos, we risk our research being put to the service of capitalism. The positively knowable outcome, the research question answered in full, practice and service of knowledge as a commodity, all are the alienation of our practicing labor. The portfolios we produce and collate as the objects of our practice-based research are too positive in much the same way. To reiterate them on the page risks always a dead history. Even to compare our compositions and performances to others ends up in a limited structure of fixed signs. But this history opens up when these signs are deconstructed and these collections properly understood might make this differential history evident, but only if we approach them with our practitioner's ear. In making music, we do not pluck something natural out of the air, nor is it the product of some autopoietic human inspiration. We compose in perpetual dialogue with histories, other composers, performers, concepts and sounds, all the while forging them. When we perform, we wound the flesh of the score, carve marks into the audience, and settle into the scars that heal over, the life that fills yet signifies death. Research on, through and with practice cannot be otherwise. In a bizarre way, our reflection must be a dispossession or even disavowal of our practice. It is only in this way that we arrive at the revelation of the silent field that we play in to make music. The very act of music making is obscured in a methodology which too readily allies itself with said music making and the very style that might be our object of research can only exist in a place where that style is not. The methodology of practice-based research is thus always already a meta-methodology, in that its internal structures always rearrange its external structures and vice versa. Our research must thus locate itself at the fulcrum. Perhaps the tone row is the best analogy. Being an indivision infinitely divisible, its strict arrangement is the propensity for retrograde and inversion, a name on the cover that never becomes possessed by eye.